This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nanofabrication. I'm Chris Mack, the professor for this class, and we're at Lecture 21, Part 2 of our two-part series on evaporation. Our reading is the first half of Chapter 12, uh, our textbook by Campbell. So we found last time that evaporation was performed in a vacuum. Why do we need a vacuum for evaporation? Well, we want high deposition rates. That means we want to operate at a high temperature so that the material melts and comes off in a, at a high rate. But high temperature means a hot vapor. Hot vapors are very reactive. And if there's any contamination in the chamber, any residual oxygen, for example, nitrogen, other materials that might be in the chamber, are hot they vapor, like a metal, for example, can react if it were to collide with one of these um, gas molecules. The result would be contamination, and we would get films that weren't as pure as we would like. The result, uh, as a result, we need very low chamber pressures to avoid collisions and contamination. That means typically we want 10 to the minus 9th atmospheres, uh, which is about 10 to the minus 6 tor. Uh, we tend to uh, talk about vacuums in, in orders of magnitude. Um, so uh, essentially a base 10 logarithmic scale. Uh, we don't say it like that, but uh, we talk about 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus uh, 7 tor, for example. To get this kind of high vacuum, low pressures we call a high vacuum, um, we need to do it in two stages. We begin with a roughing pump. This is a mechanical pump that starts at atmospheric pressure and mechanically pumps out and removes as much of the gas as possible. With a roughing pump we can get down to the 10 to the minus 2 tor range, 10 to the minus 3 tor maybe, um, but not as high a vacuum as we'd like. So we need a second pump, uh, a high vacuum pump. High vacuum pumps are things like diffusion pumps, turbo molecular pumps, or cryo pumps. These pumps cannot operate at atmospheric pressure. You can't start with uh, a bell jar at atmospheric pressure and pump it all out with one of these pumps. Instead, you have to use the roughing pump to get it down first. Then uh, they use different mechanisms. A cryo pump uses uh, very cold temperatures to uh, get the gas to uh, stick. Uh, to the sides of the cryo pump. Uh, the diffusion pump essentially uh, boils some oil and forces the oil with a jet engine like uh, arrangement to, to move down, uh, pulling whatever residual gas that might be in the area with it. Uh, the common factor of these pumps is they don't have any moving parts, these high vacuum pumps, uh, and as a result they are very reliable, they last a long time. Uh, as long as you operate them in the right way. I, I actually uh, evacuated a building once when I um, turned a diffusion pump, uh, opened the valve into a, an atmospheric pressure chamber, and smoked the oil, and it was, uh, well, it was awful. So, got to use it in the right order. Roughing pump first, then high vacuum pump. One of the key uh, things we think about when we try to decide how much vacuum we need is the mean free path. The mean free path is the average distance that a molecule will travel between collisions. So if I have a vapor, for example, coming out of my melt, uh, how far will it travel in the chamber, on average, before it hits some residual gas molecule like, uh, like oxygen or nitrogen or something that that we didn't pump out. Well, this equation tells us the answer to that. It's a statistical result based on the probability of smacking into a gas molecule. Uh, it's a function of the temperature. This is the absolute temperature of the chamber, not the vapor, because what we're looking at is how likely it is it will we find a residual gas molecule after we've pumped it out, uh, and that these gas molecules are at room temperature. Um, uh, the higher the temperature, the faster they vibrate, and therefore the more likely it is that you'll run into one of them. Um, we also have the uh, uh, Boltzmann constant. We have the gas molecule diameter. Um, 
which is on the order of two to five angstroms. Uh, larger molecules, uh, will, you'll smack into them more frequently. Um, and then, of course, the pressure. Let's take an example of calculating the mean free path. Uh, let's assume that D is three angstroms, a pretty typical value for the uh, size of a gas molecule. Uh, nitrogen N2, for example, is about four angstroms. Uh, let's assume uh, 300 uh, degree K, that is uh, room temperature, and plug those in. We find that lambda in the units of centimeters, the mean free path, is 0 0.00777 divided by the pressure in Tor. Probably don't need three significant figures here. Uh, we usually want to know what the uh, mean free path is to one significant figure, maybe two, but one's probably good enough. So, uh, for example, if you use a fairly high vacuum of 10 to the minus 6 Tor, we see that our mean free path is about 80 meters. Now, typical chambers are on the order of 1 meter tall. The distance from the melt to the wafer is on the order of 1 meter. So if I have a mean free path that's bigger than 10 meters, uh, as in this case, then we can generally assume that there will be no collisions as that vapor travels from the melt to the wafer. We call this line of sight deposition. We get a straight line transfer of the vapor from the melt to the wafer. Well, this tells us you know, what the highest pressure we can live with if we want to get good quality depositions with no contamination. But it also tells us how we need to analyze the geometry of deposition uh, line of sight. So let's look at that geometry. Let's consider a single wafer chamber. So I have a, wa uh, a wafer that's just sitting directly above my source. The distance from the source to the wafer, the center of the wafer is H. Uh, but I'm going to look at the deposition at all positions. So I'll define X as the distance from the center of the wafer. So X goes from 0 to uh, the, the radius of our wafer. Then I'll think of some point X will have a distance R away from the source. And that will be vapor coming off at some angle theta. What affects the rate at which material deposits on the wafer? Well, the first thing is this distance R. You, know, you can think of uh, the vapor coming off the source in all directions equally. So a certain amount of vapor uh, coming off the source, the further away it goes, that same amount of vapor is spread over a larger and larger surface area. The surface area of a sphere is proportional to R squared. Therefore, the amount of material per unit area goes as 1 over R squared, or we say the deposition rate will go as 1 over R squared. The further away you are, the smaller amount of material per unit area you have striking the wafer. That's not the only factor, though. We also have to think about something called the view factor. Now, think about the flux of vapor traveling along this dotted line and hitting the wafer. The flux would be the number of particles per unit time per unit area. And that area will be measured perpendicular to the direction that the vapor is traveling. And any vapor that lands at this x position is going from the source in a straight line along this dotted line. So uh, the flux it will be proportional to 1 over r squared because of the surface area factor. But this flux is over an area perpendicular to the direction of travel. When it lands on the wafer, excuse me, when it lands on the wafer, it spreads out over a little bit larger area. If I look at the projection of the cross-sectional unit area onto the wafer, that a wafer area is a little bit larger. We say there's a view factor, cosine of theta, uh, so that the, the cro cross-sectional area being exposed on the wafer is the cross-sectional area of the flux divided by cosine theta. The same thing is true at the source. If I have a, a flat source, which is emitting a certain number of particles per unit area, uh, 
when I look at a perpendicular uh, direction to this dotted line, uh, I see that that view factor cosine theta applies at the source end as well. The result, the rate is going to be proportional to the first view factor times the surface area factor, 1 over r squared, times the second view factor. In other words, the rate will be proportional to cosine squared of theta divided by r squared. Now, let's use a little geometry. Cosine is going to be h over r. Cosine theta is h over r. r is r squared is h squared plus x squared. So cosine squared theta over r squared can be put in terms of h and x. And this is the result. So you can see that we will not get a uniform deposition all over the wafer. Uh, at x equals 0, I'll get a rate that's proportional to 1 over h squared. But for larger x's, I, I get a slowdown in the rate. I get a lower deposition rate out at the edges of the wafer than in the middle. We can look at this uniformity in a little bit more detail, the across wafer uniformity, by just simply asking what's the rate of deposition at a distance x divided by the rate in the center of the wafer, that is x equals 0. Let me just take the, uh, the ratio of those two terms and, and here's the result you get, h to the fourth divided by h squared plus x squared quantity squared. Well, I can factor out this h squared. Right? Pull this h squared out, it becomes h to the fourth, it cancels with this h to the fourth, and this ratio of, of rate at some distance x, um, radial position x, versus uh, rate at the center of the wafer is going to be then 1 over 1 plus h, so h, x over h quantity squared, and that whole thing squared. Well, often we're going to have distances h that are large compared to the maximum uh, x value, that is the, the radius of the wafer. When that's the case, I can use a, a Taylor series approximation uh, to this, this factor. So if I look over here and say this is 1 plus a small quantity to the minus 2 power, because right, I'm doing a 1 over this, so uh, 1 plus a small quantity to the minus 2 power is about equal to 1 minus that 2, the minus 2 power is right here, minus 2, times that quantity. Uh, so as long as x is much smaller than h, we can approximate the rate at the position x compared to the rate at the center of the wafer here. In other words, uh, this 2x over h quantity squared represents the non-uniformity, the relative uh, thickness difference as we move radially away from the center of the wafer. Well, how do we get a certain amount of uniformity? Suppose I'm willing to allow, say, 2% uh, uh, lower smaller thickness out at the edge of the wafer compared to the middle. That's actually a fairly large amount. We probably want better than that for most of our applications, but let's go ahead and say that we can live with 2% variation from the center to the edge. That means uh, uh, x over h is going to be 0.01, which means uh, x over h squared will be 0.01, which means x over h will be 0.1. In other words, I have to have a distance that's 10 times the radius of the wafer. If I had a 200 millimeter wafer, for example, 100 millimeters the radius, I would need a 1 meter distance from the source to the wafer in order to get a 2% non-uniformity from center to edge. If I want it better than that, how do I make it a better uniformity? I have to make the distance larger. But this is a, this is a little bit of a problem. The deposition rate goes as 1 over h squared. So the only way to improve the uniformity is to lower the deposition rate uh, in direct proportion. If I, if I want to improve the uniformity by a factor of 2, I have to adjust h so that my deposition rate is reduced by a factor of 2 as well. Uh, this is not a fun trade-off. This is not the kind of trade-offs engineers like. When you say, I can either have a fast deposition process or I can have a uniform deposition process, but I can't have both, well, nobody likes that. We want both. We want to figure out a way to get both good uniformity and 
uh, high deposition rates. That's hard to do with evaporation. It's one of the drawbacks of this technology. Now that's the geometry of one wafer. Uh, what we'd like to do is coat a whole bunch of wafers at once. So here's, here's an example of, uh, down here in the corner, an example of a planetarium, uh, a picture I found somewhere on the web and forgot to write down the source. I uh, apologize for that, but uh, it, you can see that we've got some, well, it's probably three inch wafers here, uh, and you can put a whole bunch of them on this planetarium. Uh, this planetarium will actually rotate around during the deposition to improve uniformity. Um, but let's just look at the geometry uh, all by itself, a single wafer off and one position in this planetarium. Well, the way in which we'll get consistent deposition rates for each of the wafers in the planetarium is by making both the source and the wafer be on the, the radius, uh, the surface of a sphere. All right, so here's the center of the sphere here, and a wafer is on one side, and the source is down here at the bottom. Um, I'll call R0 the distance from the source to the center and the same distance from the wafer to the center. I'm only considering the, the midpoint of the wafer here. So theta is the angle that this uh, uh, H distance between wafer and source makes with the radius. And we can now look at the deposition. Well, we've got uh, a rate that's proportional to two of these view factors, uh, same cosine squared uh, theta, and then a, a 1 over distance squared, in this case 1 over h squared. Uh, so the rate's going to be proportional to this, just like it was uh, when we looked at the single wafer geometry. But here's the difference. Because we've arranged the wafer in the source to be on the surface of a large sphere, we can look at the geometry here and relate cosine theta to h. Right? So if I, if I drop a normal down from the center to h, you see that half of h is, is one leg of this right triangle. And uh, cosine theta will be this h over 2 divided by r0. OK, now square that. Cosine squared theta is h squared over 2 times r0 quantity squared. Plug that in. Plug, uh, square this term and plug it in here. Look, the h's cancel out. We get 1 over 4 times r0 squared. And that's true independent of theta, independent of h. So I could have a wafer down here. I could have a wafer up here at the top. Uh, the h values are going to be different. The theta values are going to be different for all these different positions of wafers in the planetarium. But the rate is still the same. The rate will be proportional to 1 over the quantity 2 times r0 squared. So this distance, r0 plus r0, is controlling the deposition rate. And at least from the point of view of the center of the wafer, every one of the wafers will have the same deposition rate. Now you look at the uniformity across the wafer, and you see that we have the exact same situation as with the single wafer. Uh, so the uniformity problem is exactly as it was before, but at least we're able to uh, get the same results on every single wafer in our planetarium. Okay, one last important topic to talk about, and that's step coverage and shadowing. These are related, not, not the same thing, but they're related. Remember that the vapor is traveling in a line of sight way from the source to the wafer. And it's going to hit the wafer at some angle. Uh, this angle will be different for different wafers in the planetarium. And if I have a single wafer uh, chamber, it's going to be different at the edge of the wafer versus the center. So let's look at these uh, vapor uh, atoms or molecules arriving at the wafer uh, at some angle theta. What does that mean? Well, if the vapor hits the wafer and sticks. Uh, we talk about something called the sticking coefficient. If the sticking coefficient is 1, that means it hits and it doesn't move. So if it hits and stays where it's at, what's going to happen? Well, we're, we're going to get two phenomena. We're going to get, first of all, shadowing. That is, there'll be a shadow of this sidewall here, 
that prevents deposition on the wafer in the region that's in the shadow of the sidewall, which of course depends on the angle. So uh, right in the center of the wafer, in a single wafer geometry, I'll have uh, vapor that's perfectly vertical, and there'll be no shadow. Out at the edge of the wafer, I'll have the maximum amount of shadow because of the ma maximum angle, and I'll have a bigger uh, shadowing effect. Uh, a related but different phenomenon is step coverage. Uh, if you think about the rate at which the deposition occurs down here at the bottom, you know there's that cos and theta view factor at work. But if I look at the rate of deposition on this sidewall, the angle is now different by 90 degrees. This uh, has a sine theta view factor here. If the angle is, say, 45 degrees, well then it will be the same. I'll get the same deposition rate at the sidewall compared to the bottom. But if the angle is not 45 degrees, I will not get the same deposition rate. And therefore, I'll have a thickness on the sidewall that's different than the thickness on the top and bottom. Think of the extreme, just normally incident ion, uh, not ions, but normally incident uh, vapor atoms coming down and hitting the substrate. They'll deposit at the bottom here, they'll deposit at the top, and I'll get nothing deposited on the sidewalls because nothing hits the sidewalls. Um, this will be zero step coverage. Whereas if I came in at 45 degrees, I'd have the maximum step coverage, but also very large shadowing effect as well. Sometimes having poor step coverage is what you want. Uh, there are some processes called liftoff processes, for example, where I don't want to coat the sidewalls of, of say, the silicon dioxide. Um, but most of the time, what we do want is good step coverage. We want our film to, to go over the step and be uh, a consistent thickness as it goes over that step. So what can we do to improve the step coverage? Well. One thing we could do is rotate the wafer. Uh, in particular, in a planetarium, we can we can rotate so that uh, at, at some point in time the angles. If I look back here, uh, if if the angles coming here and I, I miss this area here and it's in the shadow, if I then rotate the uh, the wafer by 180 degrees, now I'll have the exact opposite. It'll be this side that's in the shadow, and this side will get uh, deposition occurring. Right. So I can sort of uh, uh, fix the shadowing. Uh, really what I can do is make, make the shadowing be the same, symmetric, a symmetric amount of shadowing on both sides. Um, also, uh, I can make the step coverage symmetrical. So the right and left side step coverage um, will be symmetrical. It may it may not be very good step coverage, but at least it will be the same. I'll still have um, poor uh, thickness in the shadowed region, but again, it will be symmetrical. The greater the aspect ratio of the hole uh, that I'm, or the structure that is causing the shadow, the worse the problem is. Uh, and this is the kind of result you get if I simply rotated the wafer around. You can see that here in this region, I, I get less deposition than in the middle because of the shadowing, and also uh, uh, I can get some you know, higher depositions on the top towards the sidewalls, but not as much on the bottom. The other option, which we sometimes do simultaneously, is to heat the wafer. Now, heating the wafer can cause movement of the material after it hits the wafer. That is, it reduces the sticking coefficient so that the material starts to move around, diffuses around. With a heated and rotated wafer, I can improve the step coverage, reduce the shadowing. Uh, I can't make it perfect. Uh, I, I, the, the material won't move far enough to get perfect step coverage. It's also limited by the possibility of chemical reactions. If you heat it up too much, things start reacting, and all kinds of, of, of nastiness that you don't want to occur might occur. So let's look as an overview of the good points and the bad points of evaporation as a deposition technique for semiconductor manufacturing. First of all, the good point is cheap. It's easy. It's a high throughput process. Um, at least in the case of these smaller wafers, I can uh, 
uh, process a lot of wafers at once. Um, you can deposit metals, most metals, not all metals, and a few dielectrics as well. That's the good part. And this is why this technique is used very frequently in universities where you need a lot of flexibility and you can't spend a lot of money. Uh, it has the ability to evaporate lots of different materials as well. It's not very good for high melting point materials though. Uh, the vapor is hot and thus reactive, which means I have to operate it at low pressures, which means I have this line of sight um, deposition, which me makes it uh, difficult to get good step coverage. It's hard to deposit alloys control controllably. Um, E-beam evaporation helps with the quality of the films, but it does cause x-rays, secondary electrons, which can be damaging for some devices. We have this trade-off between throughput and uniformity. Nobody likes that, uh, but uh, that's the way it is. And step coverage is difficult with evaporation because of this line of sight uh, deposition. So that's our basic overview. We'll find out next time that we can solve most of these problems by switching from evaporation to sputtering as our deposition technique. Let's look at what we've learned so far. Let's see if you can answer all these questions. How can we control the mean free path of the vapor? What's the dial we use to get more or longer or shorter mean free paths? Explain the view factor, the one over R squared deposition rate dependence, and both of those factors impact on a cross wafer uniformity. Why is shadowing and step coverage a problem? And what do we do to try to solve that problem? We can't eliminate it completely, but what techniques do we have to mitigate the shadowing and step coverage problems in evaporation? And finally, explain the advantages and disadvantages of evaporation. Well, that covers second part of our two-part series on evaporation. Next time, we'll talk about sputtering. Till then.